1492, three ships sailing under the flag of Spain made landfall in what is the Caribbean today. The expedition was led by Italian explorer Christopher Columbus, who was convinced that they would find a new route to India by sailing west. But instead of opening up a new route to the East Indies, Columbus's arrival set in motion events that would lead to European colonization in the so-called New World and the eventual conquest of vast territories in the name of the Spanish Crown. How's it young stashes? My name is Dr. Jacob Sainert. This is Stashy, my trusted companion in all things history, and you're watching The Historian Stash. Now, for the next three episodes, we will be looking at various case studies on how European nations expanded into and conquered other parts of the world. Our three case studies will be the Spanish conquest of the Americas in the late 15th and early 16th centuries, the Portuguese conquest of Africa from the 15th to the 18th centuries, and the Dutch conquest from the 17th up until the 18th centuries. We'll only be covering the period of the 15th to the 18th centuries, looking at how European expansion led to conquest and eventual colonization, which in turn paved the way for a slave trade that would have a massive impact on the indigenous societies of the colonized territories. Note here that our main focus will be on Spanish, Portuguese and Dutch expansion and conquest, as these three countries were the most active of the European nations during this period. So, on that note, let's go. In the 15th century, while the Portuguese were looking for alternative routes to India around Africa, the Spanish were looking for western routes to India. In 1491, Christopher Columbus persuaded Queen Isabella of Spain to support a voyage across the Atlantic Ocean in the hopes of finding a western route to India. Eventually, in 1492, Columbus set sail across the Atlantic with three ships, the Santa Maria, the Pinta and the Niña. Columbus's method of navigation was called dead reckoning, which meant that sailors were using educated guesses of the speed of the ship, the wind currents, as well as the ocean currents to determine their location. Dead reckoning was used by the majority of sailors during the 15th century to determine their location and trajectory. As we saw in previous episodes, European knowledge of the world at that time was relatively limited and most sailors used ancient maps like this one. Evidently, these oaks didn't pay any attention in geography class. <coughs> So when Columbus set sail across the Atlantic Ocean, he truly believed that he would reach Asia via a westerly route. In reality, Columbus reached the Caribbean islands near what would later be called North and South America. But he was convinced that he had found the East Indies and outlying islands of Asia. After his first voyage in 1492, Columbus continued with three other voyages from 1492 to 1496, 1498 to 1500 and 1502 to 1504. On his first voyage, he somewhat claimed San Salvador, Cuba and Hispaniola 
as Spanish possessions. On Hispaniola, he built a fort and left Spanish soldiers behind to search for gold, while he slipped back to Spain. On his second voyage, Columbus took a thousand Spanish colonists to settle in Hispaniola. This would become the first European colony in the so-called New World. Therefore, Columbus had, through a mistaken assumption, discovered new lands with untold riches. In the early 1500s, the Spanish began to conquer the mainland of Central and South America. Vasco de Balboa, a Spanish merchant, was considered the first of the notorious conquistadors. The word conquistador refers to a leader in the Spanish conquest of America in the 16th century. It literally means one that conquers in Spanish. Now, Balboa is best known for defeating Apollo Creed and Ivan Drago. Oh, no, wait, that's the wrong Balboa. Vasco de Balboa was the first European to see the Pacific Ocean. However, his expedition didn't end too lacquer because one of his rivals, the newly appointed governor of Darien, which is Panama today, had him executed. Rough deal. Today, Panama honors Balboa by naming its monetary unit, the Balboa, after him. In 1519, another Spanish conquistador, Herman Cortes, led an expedition into present-day central Mexico in search of land and gold. He arrived with 500 soldiers. They brought with them cannons, dogs and 16 horses. Cortes first defeated the Tlaxcalans, which were enemies of the Aztecs. He then formed an alliance with the same people he had just defeated in order to defeat the Aztecs. Thousands of Tlaxcalans who wanted to see the destruction of the Aztec Empire joined him as he rode to the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. The Aztec ruler, Emperor Montezuma II, greeted Cortes with gifts because he believed that he was the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl, who had come from the sea. He allowed Cortes to enter the city in order to learn more about the Spaniards and their intentions. But when the Spaniards saw large amounts of gold and other treasures, they betrayed the emperor, held him hostage and began to rule the empire. With the assistance of the Tlaxcalans and after many bloody battles, the Spaniards eventually defeated the Aztecs in August 1521. The Spaniards conquered the remaining Aztecs and took over their lands, forcing them to work in gold mines and on Spanish estates. The fall of Tenochtitlan marked the end of the Aztec civilization, which had existed for centuries. The city was looted of all its treasures and then the buildings were blown up with barrels of gunpowder. On the ruins of Tenochtitlan, the Spaniards built Mexico City. Today, the city's cathedral rises over the ruins of an Aztec temple, and the palace of the Mexican president stands on the site of the palace of Montezuma. The Spanish called their new colony in Mexico, New Spain. Francisco Pizarro was a Spanish conquistador who left Spain for the West Indies in 1502 and lived on the island of Hispaniola. He was also part of Balboa's expedition to the Pacific Ocean. Pizarro had heard of tales of a southern land rich in gold, so during the 1520s he led two expeditions down the west coast of South America. On his expeditions, he saw the golden ornaments worn by the indigenous people of the Inca Empire in present-day Peru. He also wanted part of this action and got permission from the Spanish King Charles V to conquer this land and become its governor. So yeah, instead of asking the Inca Emperor whether he could enter his land peacefully, 
he asked the king, who sat thousands of kilometers away, for permission to conquer that territory. Sounds legit. Anyways, Pizarro raised an army of 180 men to take with him to Peru. Atahualpa, the Incan emperor, was captured and held hostage by the Spanish. Atahualpa's followers were tricked into paying a large ransom of silver and gold. Then, instead of sparing his life as promised, Pizarro executed Atahualpa on the 29th of August 1533 and took control of the town of Cajamarca. Pizarro then marched south and captured the Incan capital of Cusco. After looting Cusco, the Spaniards went on to control over the rest of the land. Without an emperor to lead them, the Incas found it hard to resist the Spanish invasion. They not only fought among themselves, but their weapons were no match for the guns of the Spaniards. Only one Inca community, which was high up in the mountains and difficult to reach, held out against the conquistadors. It survived until the Spanish conquered it as well in 1572 and executed its ruler Tupac Amara, not Tupac Shakur. In 1535, Pizarro set up a new capital at Lima and as governor he was responsible for bringing many settlers to Peru. Most settlers were involved in mining the vast amounts of silver and gold that existed in Peru. The Spaniards forced the remaining Incas to work for them for low wages and used forced labor in the army to build new cities and to mine silver and gold. But Karma eventually came looking for Pizarro and his fellow conquistadors. In 1538, Pizarro, along with his three brothers, fought for control over Cusco with his former brother in ethnic cleansing, Diego de Almagro. This fight culminated in the Battle of Las Salinas. Almagro was executed by Pizarro, but his son, known as Almagro the Lad, vowed to avenge his dad. Then in 1541, followers of the Lad stormed Pizarro's palace in Lima and assassinated him. Couldn't have happened to a nicer guy. The Aztec and Inca empires covered large areas and consisted of millions of people. It was only after long and bloody battles that they were conquered by the Spaniards. Various diseases brought in from Europe also helped to reduce the local Aztec and Inca populations. The Spanish were less successful against the people who occupied other areas of Central and South America. These people attacked unexpectedly and took advantage of the fact that they outnumbered the Spanish. In 1542, the Spanish founded the city of Merida, but they controlled only some of the areas around the city. The biggest part of the peninsula was still ruled by Mayan communities. The Spanish encountered particularly fierce resistance from the Araucanian tribes. After the conquest of the Inca Empire, a Spanish force moved southwards to establish the city of Santiago in 1541. They gained control over the fertile central region of present-day Chile. The Araucanians lived in the southern part of Chile and resisted Spanish control until well into the 19th century. The Spanish built a line of forts to defend their settlements against continuous Araucanian attacks and raids. The Araucanians adapted to the European style of warfare by making spears that could take out the Spaniards even while they were on their horses. Tragically, the Araucanians were defeated at the end of the 1870s after more than 300 years of resistance. They were eventually forced to live in reservations. There was also a unique kind of resistance that took place in the colonies where exploitation was taking place. This resistance came in the form of slave revolts. The most successful slave revolt in this part of the world was the Haitian slave revolt in the late 18th century against the French colonizers on Hispaniola. This revolt was led by Francois Dominique Poisson Louverture. It lasted from the early 1790s until 1804 
when Haiti won its independence. There were many other slave revolts throughout the Caribbean and Brazil. Some of these revolts failed and many of the slaves who had participated in those revolts were brutally tortured and executed. Disease and forced labor was basically a long-lasting legacy in the Americas, especially in Central America. As a result of this, populations were reduced drastically. It's estimated that the population of Mexico was reduced by 90% in the first 50 years after the arrival of the Spaniards. In Central and South America, the Spanish settlers eventually intermarried with the Incas and Aztecs as most of the settlers were men. The people of mixed racial descent are known as mestizos and now form the majority of the population. Thus, a new vibrant culture has been created. The official language of the former Spanish colonies in the Americas is still Spanish, but there are many people who carry on speaking their indigenous languages in an effort to preserve them. The indigenous people were also eventually converted to Catholicism, which remains the dominant religion in Central and South America. The Spanish conquest of the Americas was marked by both triumph and tragedy. While it brought immense wealth and power to Spain, it also resulted in the destruction of indigenous cultures and the exploitation of their lands and peoples. The legacy of this conquest continues to shape the Americas to this day, as indigenous communities strive to preserve their heritage and reclaim their rights. That's it for now. Please don't be a virtual conquistador by just watching, but not liking, sharing and subscribing to the historian stash. We're a small channel, but with your help, we can grow to new heights. Until next time, from Stashy and myself, stay Stashy.